me a ticket for an aeroplane Ain't got time to take a fast train Lonely days are gone, I'm a going home My baby sister wrote me a letter All right, we are back, and tonight we're going to be redoing my Vietnam 1965 to 1975 combat video because I screwed it up so bad the last time. Uh, so we, what we have here is a simple operation that we're going to do, and I'll start at the top. We're going to try to get into some combat. I'll start at the top of the operation um, phase so you can see kind of how it works. We have the 4th Infantry out here for the United States. Uh, with an independent artillery with no Zoc and the HQ for the fourth out here in that second deployment mode that you can do where you put out the HQ and all the attached uh, battalions. And if you don't want to know what I'm talking about for a second deployment, you want to look on page 22 of the main rule book. Uh, I believe it is 8.0 is the section. Okay, a couple things to note here. These units have some built-in artillery. Uh, the U.S. Infantry Division does not. They'll be relying on this one to lob shells. Uh, these artillery unit can fire. The dot down here means it can lob over one hex. Uh, if you don't have a dot, you can do your hex and adjacent hexes for support. The organic artillery built in here can support defensive combat, for example, on this unit here. Um, so he has a two organic artillery and that can be used for defensive support. And he has a six artillery and he has a dot so he can lob into this hex, which should be not a problem. The United States has declared this a free fire zone, which means that that avoids the, I believe it's a half penalty for artillery if it's not free fire, but this will also hurt the population. Uh, it'll, anger the population basically when you go to do the interface and you'll take a penalty for that but who cares basically the united states is going to conduct a search and destroy operation to get this uh nva regiment out of the hills they're embedded in the hills here it's the 320th division their hq is further up the hill back here just south of Halban. um so we have a free fire zone so we get our full artillery support we're going to have units of the fourth infantry moving up to here and attacking and we'll have some artillery support from this unit tucked away in the woods here. Uh, I think they don't call that woods, though. It's got a different uh, force. That's jungle. That is pure jungle. Okay. I'm not sure if they'd like to be back in there, but that's all right for this example. All right. So that's pretty much what we're looking at doing here. Um, uh, the way this game works is you're going to have... A support phase, a special operations designation phase, and special operations are like hold and patrol. You're going to have a strategic movement phase, uh, which is where you use like air transport, naval transport, I'm sorry, strategic movement and naval transport, that sort of thing, and security. Then we're going to hit an operations phase where the NLF player, the communist player, gets to dictate how things go. He's going to add, he, if he doesn't want to do an operation, he can, but if he doesn't want to, he'll ask the allied player if he wants to do an operation. So it's very odd the way the turn sequence goes in this game. Uh, so we're going to say that the NVA player is not going to be doing an operation. He passes to the allied player. Each unit can only conduct one operation per turn. We're going to be using this whole stack here to basically move up and try to wedge, dislodge that NVA uh, regiment out of the hills there. So when we do the support declaration segment, I'm going to declare this a free fire zone. And sometimes you can put this marker. There's a there's a region on the population control sheet, and you can actually put this in there. But for this example, I'm just going to set it here uh, on the map so that we know it's free fire. So I will be declaring that um, in a little bit. But for now, I'm just going to put it here to remind myself to do that, and then we'll follow the actual turn order. Uh, when you do combat in this, it's a little bit weird because you'll have two results. So you'll roll the die and use a die roll modifier, but then your results are going to be different. You're going to be consulting two different columns based on your ground combat strength that you have in the enemy support. Because I guess they're trying to show that enemy support, like artillery and stuff, could take out some of your uh, troops or cause casualties. So uh, we'll be 
going on two columns depending on each side's strength here. So we'll see how that adds up. All right, I'm going to go back and read the organic artillery again because a lot of people last time I posted this commented that that was weird. Was I doing it right? Yes, I am. It's page 20. It's 7.13 organic artillery. A unit's organic artillery can be used in any operation to which the unit is assigned and or a combat in which it contributes its ground strength. So you want to be looking at this rule right here so that no one asks me any questions about that right there. So I don't want to hear any questions about that one. All right. Uh, organic artillery can support only the unit into which it is built. So you wouldn't see this. Uh, if this HQ is getting attacked up here, you won't see him using this two to support that combat. He's going to be using that on himself. And remember, these hexes are six miles wide, folks. Okay. <laughs> so, no, they're not shooting themselves with their own artillery. I've also switched up to the NVA uh, in this example because the VC are very hard to track down. Uh, in this game, they get alert movement, they can move out of the target hex, they're extremely slippery. And I kept rolling really bad. Um, and they would constantly get away in my previous example. So I'm going to take that ability away and just put some NVA out there. Definitely a lot stronger unit. And we're dealing with the 4th Infantry Division uh, right here for the U.S. There you go. And the NVA is using the 320th uh, here on that card. Okay. All right, so let's kind of step through this. I'll make this video nice and painless. I just wanted to get a replacement up there because this can be very confusing for new players. So let's take a look at how this is going to work here. Okay, like I said, we're going to do this part right here, designation segment. The NLS player decides whether he or the allied player will commit an operation. So here the NLS player, and the reason why you, the NLF player might want to say, hey, you know, you go ahead, allied player, is because he wants to watch and see what happens so he can react properly to it. It's definitely an advantage for the communists, but then we were fighting in their, their home turf, and they did have a bit of an advantage, so... Um, I've been indicated as the operating player. I'm going to state my operation, which will be search and destroy. I'm going to note the units that I'm using, and I'm going to donate, designate my target hex, like so. So when I'm done with this operation, this uh, marker here will get flipped to ops complete, and all three of those units can't do any more ops. You can each one can only do one once. So, all right. So I'm going to designate that. Uh, it's search and destroy. It says I can roll for rangers. So off the map, or there's a ranger holding box, um, and I, I could use South Vietnam rangers in this operation. Uh, we don't have that full data here since I kind of made this little scenario up. If the roll is less than or equal to the number of ranger units in the ranger holding box, ranger units equal to the die roll can be placed in any hex containing operating units. So I might get some uh, some Arvin Rangers that are thrown into this operation also, but we won't we won't use that now. We'll just say I did not make the die roll. And those are these counters here, and most of them were um, they've been trained by you know they supplemented our units and our advisors trained them as well. So especially early in, early in the Vietnam War, uh, but no Rangers right now, and that's also. Um, I think that's present in Fire in the Lake also. I think they have a feature like that. All right, so then this game goes to a, it, it becomes all flowcharts at this point. So uh, your flowchart's going to guide you through the whole phase, really. Um, we're going to start here. And we're going to go to begin operation. The NLF player has not elected to operate, so we're going to go to no. Is the allied player or me willing to operate? Yes. And then I execute an operation. So this is where this takes over and it's going to dictate what we do. We're going to shoot all the way over here and do search and destroy. That's going to tell us to go to diagram A. Now, of course, this is a lot easier without VC being involved. Uh, the VC have a lot of options and we're going to be skipping most of the pink red stuff here. <clears throat> we're doing search and destroy. We designate our operating units, which I've done. Is this an allied search and destroy op? Yes. Roll for rangers, we're going to make that a fail. 
We're going to cut over to here and go up, declare the target hex I've done. I actually kind of did that ahead of time by accident. I should have waited till I hit the flow chart. Make sure you really follow the flow chart. We're going to declare air naval support and declare free fire zone. Okay, no air naval support. Um, normally you'll have some air points that you can put into this. Um, I am going to declare this a free fire zone. And now we're going to move. So when I move, that's going to trigger incidental attacks here, which is if you run through some, then there's also reaction movement. Uh, if an operating unit ends movement adjacent to a non-target enemy unit, that unit may move its full MP, but it does not itself cause a reaction. All right, so let's move my units. We're gonna go up here for one and enter. We don't have to enter the enemy hex. We can enter the hex if we want to or we can just stay adjacent to it, but you are allowed to go in the target hex. Remember, there's no stacking limits in this game, but I'm gonna move right next to it. Now, if I try to leave this hex, I believe it's a it's a one point penalty. I can't remember the Zach rules. Yeah, it's one point to exit an enemy ZOC. Uh, if you're in an enemy occupied hex, you pay two movement points to get out. And uh, those penalties are cumulative with the interdiction that you may cause. You can try to interdict hexes uh, to make it harder for the enemy to move and escape. So it's the best thing to do is to interdict hexes with VC so that they have a tougher time moving away from your search and destroy operation. Okay, so anyway, that's what the, that's what the two symbols here uh, mean with the reaction in the, in the IA. So whenever you see these, just kind of reference the top of the chart. Uh, are there any target units in adjacent hexes or hexes occupied by operating units? There are. Are there any operating units, that's me, in the target hex? No, I'm not in the hex. Do I want to attack? Yes, I do. And we're going to kick up to here. And that's going to take us to the very top up here where we can do some offensive interdiction. And that increases the movement point cost to leave a hex for both sides. It's a good way to try to trap enemy units. We're not going to be doing that. Uh, the defender can also interdict. Then we're going to announce our attack. Uh, normally we'd have to flip some VC units here, but we don't have any to worry about. It also makes this example a lot easier. Uh, now the defender chooses the terrain. Naturally, he's embedded in these hills. So he's going to want to choose that terrain because it's going to give him a die roll modifier. So the defender will choose hills, and then basically you just need to determine your total DRMs. And that's going to come from your combat ratio on the combat chart here. Your final ratio is going to give you a DRM, and I'm not I'm not using this 2, 3, 3, I can't stand that. Uh, it's going to give you a DRM here, and then there's also a terrain modifier. So we do need to add up our combat strengths for the attacker plus the support from the artillery. The artillery adds to the combat strength, and then the defender is going to do the same thing. So he's got, you know, the two organic support here plus the six from the HQ. It's, it's a lot. So our numbers are going to creep up there to like 16 to 15 or something like that. And again, uh, despite making the populace in the area very angry, we have declared this free fire zone. Otherwise, our artillery would be half a point, and it's, it's brutal. Um, but we're not playing... We're not doing this war to placate uh, the population. We're in it to win it. So we're going to do a free fire zone. And I should point out that there's there's no advantage or disadvantage to attacking when you're in the target hex. Just a heads up on that. Um, okay. The combat ratio, we're going to be adding up the ground combat strength here. I'm going to move this off. And each one of these battalions is three. So we have three, six, nine. This is your movement over here. This is your um, artillery strength if they had any. And this number here is the pursuit modifier. Uh, it's very handy when trying to catch the VC. So we know we have nine here. Then we have support from this artillery unit that's seven. So the US 4th Infantry is at 16 total strength. I think I added that up right. All right, now we need to defend our strength, and they are looking at a beefy uh, 7 plus 2, that's 9, plus the 6 from up here. So they are at 15. That's going to be 1 to 1 odds. 
one to one odds gives you no die roll modifiers. This is about as safe attack as you can get. But there is a die roll modifier for the hill. Uh, you can see right here, combat DRM uh, is minus one. So we're gonna be making a combat roll at minus one on the combat table, and this is where things start to get a little bit weird. There can be uh, hex side effects too. If you attack across an escarpment or water or all sea, uh, you're gonna have your values halved or things like that. So that's not taking it into effect here. All right, so basically we're right here. We're at roll a d6 and then we're at, uh, we'll be checking for casualties. And then there's some other units, things here like retreat and things like that. Any target units surviving the attack may move their full movement point in any direction. Uh, the movement is really loose in this game. You, the units just fly all over the board. It's very difficult to uh, pin things down. Okay, we're going to be making a die roll. And we'll be using this die roll to reference a chart. And the columns that we're in will, will be a little bit different uh, compared to each side. So I'll show you how that works. We'll be rolling a die, subtracting one for the hills. Uh, looks like my good days of rolling are over already. I got a zero. It's one minus one is zero. All right, when you go to figure out casualties, this is where it gets a little bit odd, so I'll try to explain this the best I can. Each side is going to take their ground combat strength, and you're going to add enemy support to it. So I had nine, and the enemy support, this is for the U.S., the enemy support was, um, I've already forgotten here, uh, was eight. Total of eight. So I had nine strength plus eight. So the U.S. is going to look on the 17 column, which is here, and we're going to go to zero. Oof. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to take uh, three casualties. All right, that's just for me. We want the first number. Now we have to check a different column for the defender. Okay, the NVA combat strength in the hex was just seven. But, you have to add enemy support, and I did have support of 7, so that's 14. Oh, he's on the same table, he's on the same column. So you see sometimes the column might change. So he is here, and we go down to 0, and he's going to take 1 casually. Now you look at the number after the slash. Uh, so that operation was a complete failure for the... Uh, 4th Infantry Division, the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, I should have come in with a lot more, but that's the way I set it up. So the NVA is looking at one casualty. Uh, that die roll didn't help any at first. I did this earlier as a test, and I got a 6 minus 1 with 5, so uh, that was a really bad die roll. God damn it, Lieutenant! Where are you going to pull back to? They're all over the perimeter! Now you be advised! You will hold in place! And you will fight. That means you, Lieutenant. Bravo, stick down. All right. So that is the result of the casual view. I can tell you right now we're not going to be able to force that NVA unit out of there. Next, you have to uh, assign casualties. Okay. The defending player will distribute losses first. All right. So now losses, you're going to have replacement points in this game uh, off to the side of the table. Now, this can be tricky because... When you take a loss, you have to pay for the loss with combat strength points. And the NVA unit, I don't think they can break down. Let me just check real quick. And if I didn't, if the NVA player didn't have replacement points, this entire unit would have to go away. Even though it's a seven, I took one loss, I have to satisfy it. But we're gonna say the NVA player has built up some replacement points and has some off board. So he's gonna absorb that one loss with his replacement points. All right, the US player. Now, he has to lose three strength points. Um, let's say the US player has uh, no replacement points. Okay, it's gonna be rare that that happens, but let's say that's the case here. He's gonna have to have an entire battalion whacked to satisfy that loss. Um, you can do combinations too, uh, but either way, it's still gonna be hard because you could do two replacement points and then one combat strength. You still have to get rid of this to satisfy that, just that one. So the U.S. player is going to eliminate this battalion, the first battalion. And uh, you're going to see that they actually, 
lost out in that battle. So I kind of beat myself again, just like I did in my Rumor of War video. Um, if you want to, you also have the option of uh, settling all your losses that were inflicted by limiting all friendly units that took place in the battle. Uh, the U.S. and V.C. Brigade regiments can be broken down to sustain losses, but uh, I don't have the option to break down here. So that was a really brutal operation. We'll call that Operation Fubar. Uh, it failed miserably. And the NVA are definitely going to hold that uh, Hamburger Hill almost. Now keep in mind, sometimes when you roll, you're going to get these symbols on the sides here. If you had support allocated with one of these, you would lose support points like helicopters or planes get shot down, things like that. All right, now the uh, NVA player does have the option to retreat, and there's no way they're going to retreat um, off that hill right now. That was a very good round of combat. They held the territory. The hill looks like it's going to be hard to take, and I d definitely did not commit them hard enough, so they are not going to retreat. Uh, we have reserve action and movement here. And we'll remove interdiction markers after this and then go reserve activation and movement. For offensive reserves, the allied player, if he's the operating player, can call on offensive reserves after the retreat segment. Uh, they can only be employed on search and destroy, which is what we just did in clear and secure. Any allied units eligible to participate in an operation. So, you know, say I had someone nearby and he's eligible to participate. Oh yeah, I guess we should probably put this on there now. That didn't end so well. Um, I wanted to bring him in as reserve. He could move his uh, full, they immediately move his full movement allowance and he gets assigned to the operation. But I don't think I'm going to be continuing this operation. I just don't have the strength to take that hill, especially after that loss. Okay, and then that's going to kick us back to, are there any target units in adjacent hexes or hexes occupied by operating units? <clears throat> there are some next to me. Uh, are there operating units in the target hex? No. Do I want to attack? No, I do not. Uh, we're going to re return to begin operation. That's going to flip us back over and go up here, and then the NLF player can elect to operate. So, for example, now he might be like, well, you really did a number on yourself here, and if he had more stuff stacked here, he might want to go on the offensive. And that's pretty much it for combat, at least ground combat, kind of a simple method in uh, Vietnam. Uh, this is a lot more simplistic. I did not do the VC this time because they're really hard to pin down and they just move all over the place. So, All right, I'm going to get this video up and I'll see you over the weekend.